Welcome in everyone to episode 116 of the Batfoot Podcast. My name is Damon here with my co-hosts David and Matt. Uh, this week we're going to be bringing the NL East division uh, breakdown slash offseason uh, review. Um, and then, well, I guess we were going to talk about some WBC stuff, but that's going to get pushed off uh, since it starts tomorrow. But David, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, been watching uh, some spring training baseballs. So they're starting to... You know, have the starters last to the, you know, third, fourth inning in terms of pitchers and the, the position players are getting three at bats a game now. So season's creeping closer, starting to yearn for some baseball that's competitive that I don't need to turn off after the, the sixth inning. But uh, Matt, how you doing? Doing pretty good. Um, I uh, I've been watching a little bit of spring training as well, even though my team's never on TV because Bally Sports is terrible. Uh, but I um. Yeah, I've enjoyed what I've seen so far. Um, there's been a lot of weird stuff with the new rules, with, especially with the pitch clock stuff. I think a lot of it's more just kind of getting used to. But, um, yeah. but yeah, we're uh, getting pretty close to the season, and uh, I'm I'm ready to talk about baseball today. So, uh, how's it going, Damian? It's going all right. Um, you know, obviously, we've been watching some spring training games since. Uh, unlike Matt, my team is broadcasting every spring training game that That's they play nice. this off season. Hey, minus two. This. Yeah. Actually, I think, sorry, I don't, everyone, they're missing one because they have a split squad game one day and they're not broadcasting the second one. So we'll be, um, but you know, that's been a lot of fun to watch, uh, watch the team. There's some nice position battles going on within, you know, fringe roster spots for LA. So, uh, that's fun, but you know, WBC is getting ready to ramp up in the next couple of days. So I'm really excited, uh, to see about that, but, uh, let's go ahead and, and just jump right into the NL East. And start with the Nationals. Uh, and David, who do you have for some uh, some players that you don't like this year? Well, I thought we were going to start with the player I do like. Are we going the other oh, way? Oh, whatever. Well, whatever. Do what, <laughs> the, I don't the know Nationals, what I'm doing. There's, the Nationals are similar to the A's in that there is not a whole lot to like. Yeah, that's what I was right like. Now. We don't like anybody. Just... <laughs> But I like Jamie Candelario. There you go. Um, coming out of Detroit, you know, last year he had a really down year, but this is a guy who's former Cubs prospect and was viewed as a top 100 guy when he came up. We talked about him when he signed with Washington and how it felt like a good a good move on a one year deal. He may be the kind of guy who ends up available at the trade deadline to a third base needy playoff team. And already we're seeing injuries in the in the the spring training games, so I'm certain the teams will need a guy to play corner infield down the stretch. Candelario coming out of Detroit, moving to a much more fr- hitter friendly ballpark. Uh, with you know a change in scenery and a change in uh, coaching, I think this is just a slam dunk of a free agent signing, and they might get a, a really decent return for him here at the trade deadline because this Nationals team is going to be looking to do nothing but sell. I think, but I, I really like Jimmy Candelario. I think he's he's going to be able to put up some good numbers even on a bad team this year. Uh, what do you what about you, Matt? Yeah, I, I was I, I agree with. You. Candelario, I liked I liked that signing as well. Uh, a guy I, I like is Kybert Ruiz. Um, this is a guy that I think kind of got underappreciated a little bit when he came over in the uh, Scherzer slash Trey Turner trade from from the Dodgers. Um, he he came up uh, you know in 2021 and played pretty well. Um, this is a guy who he, he's got good plate discipline numbers for a catcher, which is really nice. And last year he took a big step forward defensively. So I think if he can put a whole season together where he's you know, got those good plate discipline numbers. Maybe he gets a little help from the shift ban- being banned. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, he's a guy that could, uh, you know, he puts the ball in play a lot. His batting average on balls in play could go up a little bit. I don't know if he'll ever hit for a lot of power, but he could be a league average hitter as a catcher who's also a good on-base percentage guy while playing solid defense. And I think that's something that you could kind of build around with the Nationals as a guy who, you know, he's a pretty solid major league catcher. And those are honestly more difficult to come by than, than, you know, it's kind of, you kind of think right now, especially ones that can hit to a certain level. So, um, you know, having a catcher that's not a black hole in your lineup is really young. That's a really good thing to have. And I'll, I'll be interested to see how his development goes this year. Yeah. Kybert's a really good pick. One of the better pure hitting catchers um, that we have in the game. Um, he was going to be my pick if Matt didn't take him. Uh, but my pick I ended up going with was Mackenzie Gore. Um, his name's been a big talent prospect for a long time. Always struggled with command. Uh, got traded to the w- Washington from uh, San Diego in the Juan Soto trade. Washington never got to see him pitch. 
but his first nine starts that he had in his uh, major league career for the basically two months last year um, looked really, really good through him. I think he had his highest uh, most runs allowed was three in one of the nine starts and then was scoreless. And I think at four of them from that point, one of them was a rain shortened one. Uh, and then he started dealing with some injuries and started getting lit up, gave up six runs, then eight runs and then eight runs again uh, before he ended up getting shut down. Uh, I think Mackenzie Gore, it, he's always going to battle that command, but if you're able to rein that in a little bit, maybe cut the walks in half some. Um, he's a guy who, you know, obviously the comp is Blake Snell a lot for the the tremendous stuff and, and high walks, but he can be a really, really good pitcher uh, for the Nationals. But moving on to the players that we don't like for 2023. So David, who do you got for that? I am worried about Steven Strasburg and you know, that's kind of obvious, obviously, right? He's, he's not pitched in a year, two years now, actually. Now I think about it, he pitched it's last been a year. He pitched like two innings or something. <laughs> it's been since early 2021. And yeah. then last year he pitched four innings. So Steven Strasburg has not been the same since he signed that contract. And that might end up being one of the worst value contracts uh, to be signed, but it seems to be no fault of Strasburg's own and no fault of the Nationals. Just the, the consistency of these freak injuries is extremely worrisome. And what I'm really worried about is that he'll never get back to being able to, you know, pitch with any sort of success at this point. Like the fact of the matter is, is that you could probably move Strasburg and eat his whole contract because you know you're going to you know, have to pay that out regardless. No one's going to take it on from you, but you could potentially get us a, a low ranking prospect, some kind of a lottery ticket. If someone needs a good, reliable starting pitcher and you're willing to eat that contract for them. But I, I just, you know, him not providing any value at all, even with like a, you know, a borderline hall of fame level career to start a guy who won them a ring. It's just, it stinks for baseball because Strasburg has long been one of the best pitchers in baseball and you know he's not he hasn't gotten back to himself and there's no evidence that he will at any point yeah i agree with that it's it's a shame that he's dealt with so many injuries but um you know it happens with pitchers sometimes um the guy i wanted to talk about here i mean i it would have been a layup to go with patrick corbin i mean i, I think he was not taken by either one of y'all when, when i picked mine and uh, you know he's uh, close to Steven Strasburg is one of the worst contracts in baseball. His is just he's contract is value a little bit less. But uh, the guy I, I went with, I went, went ahead with C.J. Abrams. Um, I, and this is by no means me saying that I don't like C.J. Abrams. I think he's a bad player and isn't going to work out. The the reason that I picked him is because I'm a little bit worried about the profile uh, with him. The fact that I I do think that there's some things that are going to help him this year, like the you know the uh, uh, the the stolen base rules with the, with the differences and in the um, with the differences in the um, in the base sizes and then the the pickoffs, but man, last year like it's concerning with the plate discipline numbers. I mean, this guy had a 1.7 percent walk rate at the big leagues last year, and it's not something that's super concerning for a young player to come out and not have a immediate like great you know, plate discipline numbers and be like, an, look like an experienced hitter immediately. But man, that, like that is a guy who is really, really chasing a lot. And that kind of backs up his, his days as a uh, prospect too, a little bit. I mean, in you know, in 2021, he was all right. He had an 8% walk rate, which is about league average in double a, but in 2022, he had a, you know, his minor league numbers, he was he never got above 5.7% in, in either or either Washington or uh, San Diego. And then the major league walk rate is so low. And, and not to mention the fact that this is a guy who's dealt with a lot of injuries. Like 2019, he only played 34 games. 2020, he was, was the lost season for the minor leagues. 2021, he played 42 games and was injured. And last year, he finally played a, a decent amount. But he still dealt with some injuries last year. He only combined between the majors and minors. He only played like 120 something games. So this is a guy who's dealt with a lot of injuries. He his own base percentage is it's going to be pretty low just because he never walks. And 
I think he's going to be fine defensively at shortstop. I think he's he's got a, a high upside there in base running. I think he's going to be excellent. But, I mean, it's going to be hard to run the bases if you never get on. He, he feels to me like a little bit of an infield Billy Hamilton in some ways. I think he's got a higher ceiling because he hits the ball a lot harder. But I am worried a little bit about C.J. Abrams going forward. I think he needs to show some improvement this year. Yeah, he's a he's a guy who has a high floor. It just needs to, or a high ceiling. Just needs to be able to improve on that floor. Uh, the guy that I went with was Josiah Gray, um, a big time prospect uh, for them. You know, in twenty twenty one, came up, pitched seventy innings between the Dodgers and the Nationals. Uh, he was part of the Max Scherzer uh, Trey Turner deal. Uh, in his seventy innings, had a five forty eight ERA and a six FIP. Uh, so you're really hoping to see some improvement coming into twenty twenty three or 2022 Uh, also his walks per nine jumped up to over four uh, that year. And then in 2022, he pitched 148 innings. The strikeout rate stayed the same. The walk rate pretty much stayed the same. And he still had a five ERA and a 586 FIP. He's a guy I, I'm really worried about what his development's going to look like. Um, He hasn't, you were hoping to see that little bit of a jump last year. Didn't really see anything. 2023 is going to be a vital year for Josiah Gray and what that Nationals pitching staff is going to look like. Uh, He needs to be able to step up and take more of that reins because obviously we just talked about two pitchers there that we're kind of worried about in that rotation. Um, So I'm really worried about what Josiah Gray is going to look like moving forward for the Nationals. Uh, But going on to what our grade and our outlook is for 2023. Uh, David, what do you got on that one? Yeah, I'm going with a D and I'll tell you why is that I think their signings were not there just wasn't enough upside in their signings i hate dom smith as a signing i just don't think there's there's much that they can do with him um i don't like Corey dickerson i don't think he'll end up going for anything because he's kind of been just bouncing around without providing a whole lot of value um i like candelario obviously and that's what kind of keeps it from an f but they didn't really seem to go out and acquire the names needed in order to, to have a really quality trade deadline. And then this is a team that's going to be last in this division. They might be the worst team in the national league and they'll probably be like, you know, second best odds next season. I mean, this is a, a tanking team with a, a clear rebuild plan. They just traded one of the best players in baseball. It's going to be a long time for, for the nationals fans for sure. Yeah, I don't disagree with you on a, on a lot of that. I did give them a B minus for their off season though, just because I felt like some of the moves they made were guys that have been established big leaguers in the past that have some form of like out of, out of Candelario and Dom Smith and Corey Dickerson and like maybe like a Michael Chavis or somebody like some a lot of these guys are were at some point you know former top prospects who. You know, they're they're legit big leaguers. They've been around for a while. And, you know, Trevor Williams is another one. And they're not – it's not that I think they're very good, but one of them, there's a good chance, you know, it has at least a decent first half where they can trade up for prospects. And that's kind of what a team like this needs to do. It's, it's similar to what I, you know, talked about with the A's. I thought the A's was a little bit better because of, you know, a couple of the guys were more unknowns that they brought in, like like, like the Japanese guy or the, uh, yeah, it was the Japanese guy. Uh, I forget, I'm blanking on his name right now, but, uh, but yeah, the, the, this team is just like, they're just bad. I mean, last year they lost 107 games and they had Juan Soto and Josh Bell for half of that season, and they still lost 107 games. I mean, they're in probably the best division, or at least one of the best divisions in baseball, maybe not as good as the AL East, but primarily because the Nationals are in it. They're not as good as the AL East, but this is going to be a punching bag for the Braves, Mets, Phillies, and even the Marlins. And, I mean, this is just a this is a really, really rough-looking team. I'll, I'll be shocked if they win 55 games. Yeah, for me, I gave them a C, um, and they're going to be a seller dweller, just like you guys were saying. Um, you know, I don't, I don't hate some of the pieces they brought in. You know, I think Dickerson will be fine. I, I, I wonder what Dom Smith is going to look like. He's shown potential before. Like twenty twenty had a great season, albeit you know the sixty game season. Um, I think the fresh start kind of it will be interesting to see. If he fails, then we know. If he succeeds, then he'll be traded. Um, but the one guy that I really like, they picked up was Stone Garrett. Um, 
you know, an 84 at bats last year, had four homers, three stolen bases, a 276 average. And I think he hit for like a 131 WRC plus or something uh, with the Diamondbacks. They let him go. The profile is not great. Strikes out a lot. Doesn't walk, but he has some real serious power between his 500 at bats last year, between AAA and uh, the majors, he had 32 homers. Um, so I, I really want to see what he was able to do um, there. So I, I like that pickup and that kind of bu- maybe bumps it up a little bit for me, but it's going to be a bad team and, and it's going to be rough to watch for the next couple seasons for the nationals. But moving over to the Miami Marlins and David, so who do you like for 2023 on the Marlins? Yeah. So I went with uh, one of their starting pitchers, uh, one of the starting pitchers that throws very hard. One of the starting pitchers that had a, uh, uh, an ERA with begins with a three. Uh, so not the the one you're thinking of, but rather Ho, uh, Jesus Lazardo, uh, who kind of came into his own last season, finally made the adjustments needed to uh, have that success on the mound and and start 18 games at 100 innings pitched. And if if Jesus Lazardo can kind of clean up the injuries and make 25 or 30 starts here. I, he he could really be the difference for this Miami Marlins team where this rotation goes from being top heavy with just Sandy Alcantara and then, you know, kind of hunting for that, that third guy since Pablo Lopez is now gone to being one of those dominant rotations down the road. You've got Yuri Perez sitting there in triple A who can throw 100 miles an hour. You've got Sandy Alcantara who can throw 100 miles an hour. Jesus Luzardo is another guy who can throw 90, 96, 97, 98 their, their rotation is really strong and it's setting up to be so good. Luzardo was a huge reason for that last year because he was able to get so much value in those 18 games that he did start. Uh, got a lot of strikeouts, you know, kept the ball on the ground. Uh, hit, home runs were a big issue for him before. And you know, back when he was with Oakland and he was able to clean that up last year. And I think maybe the, the lack of juice ball helped him a little bit, but really it, Jesus Luzardo is the kind of guy who, he could step up this year and be like the Cy Young winner. And I don't think anybody would bat an eye just because his stuff is so nasty combined with his, you know, potential to, uh, you know, rein in those, those breaking pitches and, and keep the ball on the ground. You know, he just made all the right adjustments last year. And if you give him a full season, I think he can be really special. Yeah. I liked Lizardo as well. I thought that was uh that was guy I was kind of circling that I wanted to pick, but uh, I went instead for, um, you know, I've kind of been, we, we've talked about the trade a lot that they made with Pablo Lopez and Luis Arias, and I've kind of been the high guy on Arias and, and that trade in general for the whole offseason, so I figured I'd go ahead and just pick Luis Arias. I really, really like his profile of being able to not strike out. Um, while even though he doesn't hit the ball especially hard, he's still he's got such a good eye at the plate. He's still putting up above average walk rates. Gets on base a ton. He, he was on base at a 375 clip last year, and uh, a you know it's slugging percentage of 420. And you know like that's not fantastic, but for a guy who never hits for power, you know that's something where if you're putting up you know getting on base enough, like hit hit for average enough, you'll you'll have a decent slugging. So 131 WRC plus last year, I would not be surprised to see him repeat that, honestly. I mean, especially with the shift ban, he's a left-handed bat that he puts the ball in play a lot. I don't really think he was shifted all that much compared to some other guys, but still, uh, it's something to think about. And then the fact that, you know, if he can put up, like, okay defensive value, which in the past, like 2020, 2021, like, he wasn't a good defender, but he wasn't, like, a disaster defensively. Last year, he was really bad defensively. If he can kind of regain that back to kind of the normal, like, little below average defensive value that he's had in the past, I think he could put up a four-win season, which would be one of the best position players on this team. Uh, so I think he's a pretty good player, and I, I, I like him coming into the coming into the 2023 season. Yeah, Ryan should be a really solid player for them um, this year. Uh, the guy I went with was Trevor Rogers. Um, a guy who had a fantastic 2021 season had a 264 ERA, a 255 FIP, was striking out over 10 people per nine, and then last year really struggled. Uh, in 107 innings, the strikeout rate dropped by almost two strikeouts per nine. The walk rate bumped up a little bit. He had a 547 ERA and a 436 FIP. 
Uh, he really just didn't look all that healthy last year. It, his fastball, it, the velocity was there, but it just didn't seem to have the same late life to it. Um, and then this year coming into the, the off season, he reworked his change up a little bit. Um, and out of his in spring training, he's looked really, really good with, uh, the five innings pitch, but, and six strikeouts, four of those strikeouts have come up on that new kind of revamped change up. Uh, and he's added a sinker as well that he's going to throw a little bit more. Uh, and the velocity is back and ha- looks like it has that late life again. I'm really all in on the Trevor Rogers, you know, come back and, and upswing from looking to get back to that 2021 form this year for the Marlins. Yeah. Uh, but as far as players we're worried about, David. So I'm a huge fan of this player. And that's why I want to start with that, because I think it's this segment is less a dumping on the player and more a what what do you think can hold this team back? I think Jorge Soler is the key to whether this Miami team makes a surprise run at the division or winds up being, you know, just another medi- mediocre below 500 team like they kind of have been the last couple of years because this team has a lot of talent. But what they don't really have in that lineup is a lot of power. They signed Jorge Soler coming off of the World Series MVP season. They were looking for that, the guy who was just a year removed from hitting 48 home runs. And then, you know, this last year, he hits 13 home runs and 300 plate appearances and has, is like a league average bat at, at DH for them. That's that's not who they signed. And that's not what they need from that position. And that Miami team last year was kind of devoid of power where not a whole lot of guys were hitting home runs other than jazz Chisholm. Jorge Soler could very easily go off and hit 40 more home runs, right? This is a huge dude with a ton of power. We know what he has and we know what he can do, but the fact that he has really struggled to get to that premium power that he showed in 2019, any other season brings me worry. And what it really brings me worry for is that this lineup needs him to be hit for power this is a lineup full of contact with gene segura and luis arias they need a big power bat in there to to kind of supplement the rest of that team and if Jorge soler can't do it this team's going to struggle to score runs uh you know when when those guys aren't aren't getting on base or are in their little slumps or whatever so you know i, I think Jorge soler can be the key for this team offensively but he's He's got to get back to that 2019 form and even that World Series MVP form uh, in 2021. He, he can't keep going with this, uh, you know, sub 100, you know, WRC plus low batting average stuff. He, he's got to get to that power. And I think he can. I like Jorge Soler, but that worries me because this lineup is very dependent on his power. Yeah, that, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I, I'm i in the same camp as you. I, I love Jorge Soler. I mean, he helped my team win a World Series. and I Helped still, my team win a World Series, too. He did. I mean, it's it's worrisome. Though, he did the not way help that, my team win a World Series. No, he did not. He, <laughs> he, he hurt your team. But um, actually, I don't think he played much in that series. But either way, um, so I the guy I, I'm worried about this year, I, I don't I don't like – I don't want to say I don't like him because I think he's – right there's a good chance he's a good player, but it's, it's jazz Chisholm. And let me preface it by saying like, like, again, like I like jazz Chisholm. I think he's got a lot of talent, but there's a lot of concerning things here that make you think compared to the expectation of him, which he just got put on the cover of MLB, the show, like people think he's a superstar all of a sudden. And this guy has played in his career. The most games he's played in a season at the big league level is 124 in 2021. He's dealt with injuries in both of his full big league seasons. And in 2021, he wasn't, really wasn't all that good. Offensively, he put up a 97 WRC plus, And his chase rates are horrible. Now, he's got a lot of pop in his bat. He hits for power, which is good. And that's what, like, uh, like David said about Jorge Soler, this is another guy that they need him to hit for power. And, uh, but, you know, last year he put up a 139 WRC plus, but it was only in 60 games and the chase rates are still really bad. And he's dealt with a lot of injuries already. And the fact that they're moving him from shortstop slash second base, the center field coming off an injury, his arm strength isn't very good. Uh, he was in the 23rd percentile last year. Uh, he does have good sprint speed, which is, which is nice, but 
like it, it feels like you're tanking some of his defensive value if you do that mm-hmm. because he's going to be learning a new position. Like if he goes in the outfield and he's really good in center field, then you then maybe that's maybe it works and he's and you know center field's obviously a very valuable defensive position, but he's never played center field at the big league level, and I don't know if he's ever played it at the minor league level either. So this is a guy who I, I like Jazz Chisholm. But the plate discipline numbers are very concerning. That was the concern with him in the minor leagues as well. And um, I like him, but do I think he's, uh, you know, they're, if they're expecting him to be a superstar caliber player, I just think they're going to be disappointed. Like, if you're looking for a guy who's a little bit above average at the plate, who plays, who runs the bases really well, and maybe plays solid defense in center field for like a three war type player, three to four war type player, then then he's probably, you know, then he's there's a good chance it gets to that. But and he does have the upside to be more than that. It's just you know, people act like he's going to be like a you know an MVP candidate, all star. Like, and I just don't see that with him right now. I mean, he he's got a chance to eventually, but you know that's he's not he's not the type of player at this stage that can carry a team like like he would need to carry the Marlins for them to be successful. I would say that I don't know that center field arm strength is really going to be that big of a deal. It's, it's given not that a huge deal, but. I mean, range is so much more important for a yeah. center fielder. You know, we we've seen the the big arm center fielder like Kevin Kiermeyer. Like that's that's good, but he's getting his value from the range that he showed and the instincts rather than the arm. So I, I don't know that much that hurts him. It's yeah. the inexperience, like you said. Right, right. I mean, that's what I'm saying. He's never played in the minor leagues or the big leagues. He's never played center field. I mean, and yep. and or outfield in general. I mean, so you know, you would think that he's got the athletic ability to have that range, but does he have the? You know, it's going to take some time to get where he reads the ball off the bat, and you know, it's just, you know, it feels like it's a work in progress. Maybe they, you know, I, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Yeah, well, there better hope that that range uh, is a real thing because uh, the guy that I have playing in right field in Avisail Garcia has absolutely zero range and is not a good outfielder um and he's going to be playing right field for them uh you know when we were looking at it it's funny he every odd year he's really good at thanks to matt for pointing that out uh when we were we were prepping and so you think 2023 is going to be a great year for avisel garcia and would anyone be shocked if it is probably not because the history says will repeat itself but looking at him what he did in 2022 it scares the hell out of me. Mm. His barrel rate dropped. He's not a guy who walks a lot. He strikes out a lot. His barrel rate dropped. His max exit velocity dropped. He only hit for eight homers after hitting for 29 the year before. Obviously, I know Milwaukee to Miami, but still, this was a guy that they were hoping would still hit for 20 homer power. He had a 66 WRC+. plus. He was their big free agent signing uh, last year. was supposed to be the key cog to this offense. Um, and, you know, a veteran clubhouse leader, which the, the clubhouse leader, that, that role should be there for him. But being a bad outfielder defensively already and then hitting for a 66 WRC+, plus, the de-juiced ball I think really hurt him looking at the underlying stats kind of backs it up. Uh, his swing seemed to struggle. You know, wasn't barreling pitches as much, striking out more, walking a lot less. It just, he scares the hell out of me and I, I don't, I don't see what, I mean, I didn't like the signing when they signed him in the first place, but after seeing 2022 and it being backed up, man, Avasayo Garcia really scares me. He's he's dealt with injuries too. And that's another scary thing like that, you know, for a guy who's 32 years old. Yeah, so. absolutely. But uh, mm-hmm. what is our, our outlook slash grade for 2023? Yeah, so this this team screams like a middling team. Like I kind of looked at their roster and I was just like, wow, I, it's all very meh, except for like Sandy Alcantara, like we said. And then I, I, I think the couple of guys we mentioned, you know, with Arias and, and Luzardo and even Rogers was good, but he just wasn't good last year, you know, and, and that, that kind of puts him in the middle. This I, I wouldn't be surprised to see this team go to 500, but I also wouldn't be surprised to see this team win 70 games. I don't think it can contend in this division, but the the upside in that starting rotation is so good. I still wish they would have done a little bit more of work addressing that lineup because they are relying on those signings from last year in Soler and Garcia. And if those guys can't get there, 
this offense is going to struggle mightily and it's going to look, you know, it's going to hurt this starting pitching staff and their, their bullpen's pretty good too. I, this team has done a, a marvelous job in getting to a point where they are not just a laughing stock like the A's and like the nationals and some of these other teams, right? They've developed prospects. They've made good signings. They've, they've worked on their development and now a lot of their pitchers throw a hundred and their hitters, you know, like jazz Chisholm are able to come up and do well, but they need something to get them over the top and take that next step. I don't know that they have it yet this season, unless Yuri Perez comes up and is just incredible, but you know, this is definitely going to be a team that's interesting to watch. And that much is something that we can say more of than for the nationals. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of on a similar page with you. I, I think this team somewhere in the middle, uh, you know, they're not one of the worst teams in baseball. Um, you know, they, they're on a tier of, they're on a tier, they're a tier above like the nationals and the A's and the reds and the pirates maybe. And they're, they're, they're a tier below the Braves, Mets, Phillies, Dodgers, Padres. like they're a tier below that. They're somewhere in the middle. I don't think they're especially close to being a playoff team. And there's a world where, you know, the, the pitching does boost them up and maybe they get bounce backs from a couple of these guys. But I, I mean, I, they're still kind of building. I give them a C for the off season. Just there were a couple of moves. I mean, I, I could go either way on that Arias Lopez move. And I think it's okay. Like I like Arias and that's kind of the reason that I, I, I don't hate it as much as some people do, you know, like the, I mean, I like the Jane Segura move. I think that's adding a pretty good big leaguer to the lineup that is a solid player. Like he's consistent at least. I I do not like the Johnny Cueto move very much. You know, I, I mean, it's just, I just don't. There's this team just doesn't seem like the, the with the lineup has no upside to it. Like you have like literally one player in your lineup who is capable of, and, and it's the guy I didn't like too. And, and jazz Chisholm that's capable of taking a step to being like a star type player. And I don't think that's going to happen this year, but you know, and, and then they're pitching, like there's a lot that can go wrong with this pitching staff too. I mean, like Lizardo has a track record of one year where he was last year, he made a lot of real improvements, but he wasn't, you know, it, it's not a long track record. And, you know, you've got like Johnny Cueto had a good year last year, but man, he's just not going to be, he's not going to be that guy again. He, he you know, and, and then Trevor Rogers, I, I think he could be better this year, but he's like been inconsistent. Cabrera's had inconsistent command. You're dealing with a lot of young guys. Like I think the biggest thing for this team this year that I would like to see out of them is for some of those pitchers, those young pitchers to really develop and turn themselves into, okay, this is two years in a row of Lazardo being really good or Trevor Rogers you know, last year was kind of a fluke that he was bad. Like he's back to being good again. And Rudy Cabrera figured things out. And, and like you mentioned with Yuri Perez, like I'd love to see him at the big league level late in the season. I think he's like one of the most talented pitchers in the minors right now. So, uh, but I, this this team, I think this team wins in the, somewhere in the seventies, the amount of games they win. I, I don't think they get to five hundred, but they're not a disaster. Yeah, I gave them a C. Um, my outlook is it's going to be a fun team to watch, but they're not going to quite be a contender. Um, being able to watch Jazz, who's flashy, brings the energy. That's going to be a lot of fun. Watching Sandy Alcantara pitch, like that's a lot of fun. Jesus Lazardo, when he's on, is nasty. If Trevor Rogers looks like what he was in 2021, he's very good. I I really do like the Johnny Cueto move. Actually, he seemed to really find it last year again. Um, all the stats seem to really kind of go back to what his career averages were, and being that kind of veteran presence to that that rotation that it hasn't had really it's been a lot of young guys for a long time and being a a foreign veteran presence to that that pitching staff i think it's going to help a lot um and, and i also like the aj puck move we didn't really hit on that but um when it happened even uh but i think getting him in that bullpen he could be their potential closer uh I, I like that move a lot. So I, I gave him a C. I think it's a fun team to watch, but they're not going to quite be a contender with this division and even in the National League. Uh, but moving over to the Phillies and David, I think me and you are, are uh, we're going to go our old teams here. Uh, so who do you got for for who you like this year? Oh, yeah. I, I can't go talk about the Phillies without talking about Kyle Schwarber. Um, and I, it was tough cause I almost wanted to talk about Nick Castellanos, another former cub, but 
yeah, I really, really like what Kyle Schwarber has been able to transform himself into since uh, <laughs> since the Cubs non-tendered him. They they let him go uh, before uh, 2021, coming off of the 2020 season, and he's done nothing but hit a ton of home runs. Uh, and last offseason signed with the Phillies for, I think, five years. And this that deal is going to look so good for the Phillies, man. I, Kyle Schwarber is already led him to the World Series once. And with 46 home run season last year, the ball's been dejuiced and Schwarber's still going, going crazy with hitting homers. Um, you know, his approach is very much fitting of the modern game, which is he's taking huge hacks. He's not so much worried about uh, making contact. That being said, the reduction of the shift, man. I mean, if you, you know, last year he only had a 218 batting average, but was still able to hit 46 home runs. You know, you, you, you take that result, but you, you kick up the, the batting average and the on-base percentage about 30 points. You're looking at one of the best hitters in baseball uh, just because the shift may go away. So uh, I think Kyle Schwarber's, you know, the the type of guy that can make a run at 50 home runs next year. Uh, and he can carry this offense while Bryce Harper's out. Uh, just a, a massive, massive change for him. Now he's probably not going to play good left field defense, but it, it's the, he's been, he's able to to hold his own enough out there to where it's not a complete disaster. Um, and he'll get time at DH obviously, but with Harper potentially needing to play DH when he comes back, you're going to look to see Kyle Schwarber in left field a lot and Nick Castellanos in right field a lot. And it's, it can get hairy at times, but I, I still, I just think the bat outweighs uh, the defense here and, and it'll be a, a good, he'll probably hit lead off again. Although Trey Turner might get to play lead off either way. Both of those guys, I mean, well, Damian will probably talk about Trey Turner here in a little bit, but like the, the Phillies lineup is going to be just as good as it was last year. Yeah, the, the guy I wanted to talk about from the Phillies was uh, it's, it's JT Romuto. Um, mm-hmm. This guy is a very, very, very like he, I don't think he's underappreciated at this point how good of a player he is. Like the last year he played, you know, as a catcher, he, you know, he, he played 140 games last year as a catcher, which I mean, there's a lot of catchers that are all star level catchers playing like 120 games every year. He's trying to play every single day. Put up a 128 WRC plus. He's, he's still a fantastic defender. He stole 21 bases. He was a 2020 catcher. And you look at his baseball savant page, his sprint speed is in the 86th percentile with, with, for a catcher, which is insane. All of the, all of his batting numbers are in the red, except for, you know, the walk rate, strikeout rate, which aren't bad. They're pretty, you know, they're kind of close to league average on both of those, but he hits the ball hard. He hits for average. He, he gets on base. He hits for power. He has a great arm, which is going to come into play more this year. He's a great base runner. Defensively, he's great. He's a good framer. Like, there's literally nothing. He, he's a like five-tool player that plays catcher, which is rare. So I'm very, uh, you know, I'm very excited to see what he does this year. I think he, I think JT Realmuto is one of the best players in all of baseball. Yeah, JT Realmuto is an absolute joy to watch behind the plate. Uh, but David mentioned it. I'm going with Trey Turner. Um, that's the Dodger bias kicking in. But I've always liked Trey Turner since before. Before he was even on the Dodgers when he was in Washington. He's one of the most fun players to watch. The, the speed element he brings, the power element that he's able to bring with that speed. He's he's absolute fun to watch. And uh, I do believe he's going to hit leadoff this year. Um, at least with Harper out, I think the plan was to get Schwarber down a little bit more in the lineup to have the left-handed power. Um and I believe allowing Trey Turner to hit leadoff, which is his natural spot anyways, and allowing that speed with all of the rule changes we've mentioned so much, being able to take over even more and being a real true tone setter for this lineup, even when it before it gets Bryce Harper back, but after it gets Bryce Harper back, like he is a player that he had 21 homers last year and he's getting going ready to go into Citizens Bank ballpark, which is even more of a band box. Like he, he he has potential to be a 30, 30 guy this next year. And I don't think that's even without the realm of possibility at all. Um, so it's a big offensive need for them with, with Harper going to be out for however long he's out, but Trey Turner is going to be absolute joy to watch up on top of that Phillies lineup this year. But speaking of Harper, David. Yeah. So 
the what I'm worried about is is when Bryce Harper is going to be back. You know, I think this is a really complete team. You know, we'll we'll talk about some of the other slight issues I think with the squad, but that Bryce Harper is currently out and not coming back anytime soon right now. I mean, basically all we have is that he'll be out till mid season uh, with that elbow issue. And then even then he probably won't be able to play the field. He'll probably just have to hit once he does get back. That does put a damper on this team and what they can do um, in terms of fielding for their pitchers. And I, I feel bad for Aaron Nola and Zach Wheeler because they've had to suffer through kind of a, a mediocre defense for their entire time here. And they're finally getting Trey Turner to bolster that middle infield defense. And now, you know, Bryce Harper's out in right field for, for the time being. So um, ultimately when he gets back, this offense will go from really good to scary good. Uh, but until he does and, and whether or not he's able to get back is going to be the, the big mystery that kind of might get this, this Phillies team in a hole with the two teams we're about to talk about that they won't be able to come back from. Yeah. Um, the Bryce Harper injury really, really hurts them. And, and not to mention the fact that, you know, when he comes back, you don't know it'll be late in the season. You never know how a guy might, you know, how long it'll take him to be ready. Uh, typically he, I would think Bryce Harper is a guy that would be ready pretty quick, but, you never know. Uh, the guy I picked for, for the one I don't like is Tywin Walker. I, I think Tywin Walker, I think that was a really, really bad contract they signed him to. Uh, I don't really think he's all that good. I mean, he's had one season in his career where he was a sub four FIP t- guy. That's more than, you know, last year. And I just I don't really like his stuff all that much. Um, his strikeout rate dropped last year. Uh, you know, I, I just, I don't know, man, that's a, you know, you're kind of relying on him to be your number three in your rotation, him or Ranger Suarez. And I feel like they just don't have a lot of rotation depth. If this is, if this is their answer to that, I just don't think it's going to work very well. So, uh, we'll see. I know that, uh, you know, I, I know that the, he improved a little bit with the Mets, but it's also a guy that he hadn't really stayed healthy in his career either. So, uh, in fact, it's his, his the most innings he's pitched since 2015 is 157. So, and last year he missed a few starts, and I don't, I, I just, I don't know, I, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of Tywin Walker this year. Yeah, I mean, I'm going along the same lines of the pitching. Um, Bailey Falter, Falter right now yeah. is projected to be their number five starter. Um, that's just not good enough. I mean, he was okay last year when he when he got some time but overall looking at the depth Christopher Sanchez is the next one up and in 40 innings last year he had a 563 ERA um a couple other guys one who didn't even pitch um last year or his highest level was double a another one got seven innings in the majors last year and had three, a 36 ERA they were, I think they were really hoping to get some innings from Andrew Painter this year and he's already had some elbow soreness during spring training which is a little worrisome and then mick abel he's got up to double a he might be able to get up this year as well but they just don't have that depth at all in this rotation i think that's going to be something that you'll see them attack at the deadline but at the moment like bailey falter being your number five already with the question marks of taiwan walker and then ranger suarez who was pretty solid last year but it was his first year jumping back to the rotation from the bullpen looked really good in the playoffs, but are those changes sustainable what he did in the playoffs or is it just one of those, you know, playoff performers that fall off after that? I wonder if they go to a, a an opener style format with, for that fifth spot. I mean, you could, but you also need all those people in the bullpen to, to help. Right. Yeah. And, as well. yeah, and I want to bring up, you know, to kind of, go along with your fact you talk about Andrew Painter being you know potentially having injuries they haven't done the tests yet that could be something that's pretty bad with it being yeah. elbow soreness and then the fact that Mick Abel he did pitch and he did get up to you know double a but he really wasn't very good at any level last year he was okay but he's got good stuff but he not really not really even close to big league ready yeah so they don't really have that guy yeah. so um, but let's go ahead and jump over to our grades and our outlooks for 2023. Right. So 
the Phillies signed Trey Turner in the offseason and Taiwan Walker as well. Uh, regardless of what you think of the Taiwan Walker deal, which I like it, um, but especially given that we just talked about regarding their depth, having Taiwan Walker in there is still good in my mind. But here's the thing. Trey Turner, adding him to this offense, takes this offense up to that next level. Uh, and Trey Turner was one of the best offensive players available this offseason. It doesn't matter how much they signed him for. It doesn't matter how long he went for. This offense looks super scary. I think this this offseason has to be an A. It has to be an A for any team that signed a, you know, one of the top the three or four best offensive players, right? Or added them to their team. We'll we'll get to a team here that didn't add anything, um, but the you know they, they add Trey Turner to this team. I love that. It's an A for me because of that alone. And then you know this is a team that I like to get back to the World Series potentially, but I worry that they're going to have to do it through the wild card again. And that makes it much more risky. It's less predictable uh, than them going after a division. I don't think that they're able to get ahead of the Braves or the Mets by any means. They'll be in contention. They they would maybe be my favorite if Bryce Harper were healthy, but or if they had maybe a fifth starter. But as it stands, they're almost certainly a wild card team. They have a really really good offense, and it's a team that should look to get back uh, to make another deep run of the playoffs. Yeah. So. So my grade, I gave him, I gave him a B, and I like the Trey Turner signing a lot. In fact, I almost put him as if Damian didn't have him already, I would have put him as my player I like. But I really did not like the Tywin Walker ad. I thought that there was other guys who got very similar contracts that would have been a lot better ads, like Chris Bassett, Jamison Tyon. I thought were both better ads for that for the same level of contract. Uh, and then I, th- I, th- I really think they needed to address the bullpen more than they did. Uh, they added Gregory Soto, who is – I just don't think he's very good. He and, and then Craig Kimbrell, who has been – who knows what he might be. I mean, he's looked washed for four or five years now, except for like a half a season where he was really good for the Cubs. So, like, I I think he's I, – I, you know, you're adding that. And uh, Sir Anthony Dominguez is really good, I think. I think o- Alvarado made some strides last year, but – you know, I just I don't really like the bullpen very much. The rotation I think is decent. Like Nola Wheeler, are very 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 good at the top of it. But beyond that, like I don't really like Taiwan Walker. Ranger Suarez is I just have a hard time believing in him long term. He might you know he might be good, but he was good last year for sure. Um, you know, but I don't know how how much I believe in him long term. And then like like Damian mentioned, I, I agree on the fifth starter. And then the lineup is top heavy, especially without Harper. I really like Turner. I like Schwarber. I like Real Muto a lot. Hoskins, I think, is a, is a solid solid hitter. Uh, but I mean, Alec Bohm's all right. But th- their defense in the corners, uh, on the infield and in the outfield, is just complete black holes. Kyle Schwarber was one of the worst defenders in baseball last year. Nick Castellanos was the worst defender you know, past Kyle Schwarber and then Bohm is awful at third base and Hoskins is one of the worst first basemen defensively. And you're not going to have the benefit of DHing them when Harper comes back. Now Harper is good. And, you know, and it would be nice if he could play the outfield late. Maybe, maybe he can late the season this year. Maybe he'll get back to being able to play the outfield. That'll help this team a lot. Having some outfield defense there, but um, and I think that, you know, they got a couple black holes in their lineup too. Like Castellanos is really, really bad last year in the out it, as a hitter too. And Brandon Marsh just doesn't hit. Now he does play good defense, but um, I don't know. You know, this team, I think people forget like this team went, got hot in, in October, but they only won 87 games last year. They literally finished 14 games behind the Braves and the Mets. And I don't think that adding Trey Turner made them 14 games better. So I consider them a wild card team. Uh, you know, I think they're better than they were last year, probably. But I, I think they're more of a wild card team that, you know, yeah. when you get in the wild card, you never know. Someone might get hot. I mean, last year, the best team in baseball was the Dodgers, and they didn't make it out of the division series. So it's like, I, you know, I, I think that, I, I think that, that you know, it, it, the postseason is kind of a crapshoot. I really don't think this is a team that I would pick in the top – I, they're definitely not top three in my contenders of the World Series in the NL. Maybe not top four. Yeah, I gave them a B plus this year. I do think they're a division contender. I think I'm not saying that they're going to win the division, but I, there, there is a a aspect where I think that they can compete for it. Adding Trey Turner, it's a big, big jump for them. 
getting Bryce Harper back as soon as they possibly can. If it is mid season, that's going to be a gigantic help. Um, Alec Bohm has looked like the second half of last year into the playoffs. And so far what we've seen through spring training looks like he's starting to take a little bit more of a jump, maybe finding a little bit more of that power. Uh, I think Bryson Stott moving over to second base and having a second year in the majors is going to take a little bit of a jump as well. Nick Castellanos is not going to be as bad as he was last year. Exactly. And, people, and and people also forget that in this late in the year and then into the playoff, Nick Castellanos was actually a really good defensive outfielder. The Phillies made a change with him and playing him deeper rather than playing him about what you would normally play your outfielder. And he turned into a really, really good defensive outfielder um, for that little bit of stretch of time. Now, what it's going to mean through a full season, that's going to be seen. But playing Castellanos deeper where he is able to come in on the ball and not have to worry about tracking the ball backwards helped a ton. Uh, so I'm really interested to see what that's going to look like for you know full season with obviously Harper not going to be able to play um, right field. But, I mean, I think this team is... I don't know if it gets 14 games better, but I think this division is going to be a lot tougher. I think the Braves not, or not the Braves, but I think this division um, having to play everybody more as well, not just playing in this division, you know, those games from the nationals are going to be lost a little bit. I think it's going to bring the division even tighter together. Uh, I, I think the Phillies are going to be a contender for it. I wouldn't pick them as my favorite for the division at the moment, but I think there's a realistic shot that they could, be you know late in september we're talking about this being a three-horse race for the division uh but moving on to the new york mets so david who do you like on the mets yeah so this is a this is a really good team um i am going with a guy who i'm trying to make sure i have his split here but last year uh, jeff mcneil hit 326 on the whole season uh Batting average, 382 on base percentage, had a 143 WRC plus, was worth six wins above replacement, which is really, really good. Um, and it was kind of a career year for him. He went and signed a $50 million extension. But I just wanted to point out that in the second half last year, he batted 356 uh, with a, a 150. No, yeah, it is 156. Yeah, 159 WRC plus uh, in a 404 on base percentage, a 494 slugging percentage. Uh, he went absolutely crazy in the second half last year, and he did that while walking just as much as he struck out at like 7% of the time. Uh, this is a rare like contact hitter who can get, uh, you know, velocity on the ball coming off of his bat. Uh, he's versatile. He can play second base, third base, and any of the outfield positions. Uh, you know, this is such a valuable cornerstone to a roster, having a, a versatile guy who can also uh, really transform your offense from the top of the order. I expect that he'll hit first or second all season. He's going to be just on base all the time. Uh, the lack of the shift is going to even maybe kick up his batting average a little bit. Uh, love Jeff McNeil going into this season. Think he's, uh, you know, he, now that he's finally gotten paid, I think he's uh, prime for another big year. Yeah, I, I went with uh, Brandon Nimmo. Um, I thought that Brandon Nimmo was a guy who in the past, I, I thought he, he, I liked some of what he did, but he struggled defensively at times and he, uh, and he couldn't stay healthy. And last year he stayed healthy and he was decent defensively, which was a really big step in the right direction for him. If you look at him, a lot of, he's got a connotation as a guy who doesn't hit the ball, especially hard. But if you look at his stat cast numbers, he actually hits the ball pretty hard. He's in the 80th percentile in max exit velocity, and he's in the 57th percentile in average exit velocity. So he's consistently hitting the ball pr pretty hard. His hard hit rates about league average. He, he doesn't have a huge launch angle, but this is a guy who, he gets on base. He doesn't strike out a lot, and he just gets on base. Last year, a 367 on base percentage. The past two years before that, he was above 400 in the on base percentage. Uh, 134 WRC plus last year from a center fielder who's playing pretty good defense. Like put up five wins, played 151 games. If he can stay healthy again this year, I wouldn't be surprised to see him put up a similar type of season he's a good player i don't think he gets talked about very much a lot of people talk about lindor or alonzo or or mcneil or somebody for, for and for good reasons those are good players too but uh i think brandon nemo is a guy that, that really um 
kind of gets overshadowed a little bit and, and he deserves a little bit more credit than he's gotten. Yeah, Brandon Nimmo was he's gonna be really good for them. Um the guy that I I picked was Kodai Senga. I'm really excited to see him. I'm higher on him than most people are. Um that ghost change up or ghost splitter, whatever he has looks absolutely nasty, even so far in spring training. Um you know, he's going to need to be a big part of this Mets rotation this year. Uh, we'll talk about that here in a minute of why that is. But I think there's a level here of what Kodai Senga could do um, that I don't think many people are talking about. Through his his MVP career in, uh, was it 1,340 innings? He has a 242 ERA. Uh, the injury concern is there, but he's a guy who... The, the stuff is there as long as he's able to stay healthy and stay on the mound. Uh, he's going to be really fun to watch. Uh, one guy I did want to just mention though, because none of us picked him was Francisco Lindor because yep. he finally found himself last year. I think in 2021, he was starting to press a little bit too much, trying to prove that he was worth that contract. But last year he had, it was almost on par with his, you know, 2018 and 2019 seasons with, with Cleveland as well, batted back to 270, a 339 on base, a 127 WRC plus, and a 6.8 WAR. Lindor is a joy to watch when he's that good. Yeah, well, let me give my uh, worried players here because it it'll be two, but it's for one specific reason. You all know what it is. The Mets rotation is led by Justin Verlander and Max Scherzer. Those guys are. 41 in 38 going into this season. Um, and they're being paid, I think more than like six teams, uh, entire rosters are being paid. So, you know, I am a massive Max Scherzer fan. Absolutely love the dude. He's one of the best pitchers to watch in baseball. Um, Justin Verlander has been one of the best pitchers in baseball for a long time. They're both surefire hall of famers, but they are coming towards the end of their careers. Can the Mets handle one or both of them being out from extended periods of time? We do not know, right? The Mets have good rotation depth, but the upside is not there as it is with a, a good version of Max Scherzer or a good version of Justin Verlander. Those guys are, when when on, are still the best pitchers in baseball. So like, Justin Verlander literally did it last year. Can how can they rely on those guys all season? Are they what are they going to do? They've been talking about six man rotation. They've been talking about you know the potentially resting those guys. Those guys might not get as many innings. We'll see what happens. They need those guys for the playoffs, but they also need to you know get in there and win this division so that they don't end up in that shorter series like they did last year where they lost you know just two games in a, in a three game set and that was it for a really good team last year. So. Um, you know, the Mets are, are, I think, in a position where they're relying on some very volatile arms, despite their previous reliability, um, that, you know, it, it could really backfire on them if, if both Verlander and Scherzer end up going down. And I think, you know, two guys who are sitting at 40 and 38, you know, they're not, they're not going to be a hundred percent reliable. They won't be there the whole season. So, um, you know, I just, it's tough. It's scary. And that's what I'm worried about. But ultimately, I think this team is really good. So, uh, Matt, who are you worried about this season for the Mets? Yeah, I mean, I, it's not really a one specific player as much. I mean, I, I put Dan Vogelbach, but it's mainly just kind of like, who are they going to DH? Um, because they don't really have a lot of just big thumpers in their lineup other than Pete Alonso. Uh, like, they, they don't – last year that was a little bit of their problem was just there's they just didn't slug very much. They had a couple – they had Pete Alonso and then a bunch of guys who were really good on base guys, but they just didn't hit for much power. And I think that Dan Vogelbach is kind of in that mold in the fact that he's got some power, but he just doesn't tap into it very well. Like, in fact, his career high slugging percentage is 439. And – you know, last year he had a career year, you know, fed by a batting average on balls in play that was like 40 points above his average for his career, which it was only a 290, but it was way above his career average. And he could sustain something higher than he has in the past, maybe because of the shift ban. But, um, you know, for a guy who at his size, he doesn't especially hit the ball that hard. Like his max exit velocity was the 70th percentile last year. 
Uh, his hard hit rate was below league average. He walks a ton, but he strikes out a lot. I, I mean, I like his discipline numbers and stuff, but it's just – it's not great. And then, of course, you know, there's not really another option too. Like it gets lefties. Like they still have Darren Ruff, but he was really bad last year. And I don't know. I think that's going to be a trouble spot for them. I would have liked to have seen them add somebody in that, that could DH that had a little bit more pop in their bat. So, Yeah, they're probably going to use Tommy Pham as a platoon with Vogelbach, he, um, which he crushes lefties, and Vogelbach crushes righties, so I don't think it's all that bad. But, um, you know, the, what I'm really worried about is their bullpen. Obviously, they have Edwin Diaz, who is – really good. I mean, we, we all know what Edwin Diaz was this last year, but outside of that, I mean, it's what kind of David mentioned with their, their, you know, rotation, you got two 40 year olds in the rotation. Your three of your key relievers are 34 or above this year. And it's ones that have dealt with injuries in the past, like David Robertson. He's supposed to be a big part of this bullpen, Adam Ottavino, who's been up and down. Uh, and then Brooks Raley, who is really good um, at times. And he's, He's proven the last couple of years to be really good. But outside of that, I mean, it just, I mean, Liza Hernandez, John Curtis, Drew Smith, like these aren't guys that give you a ton of confidence um, for what that bullpen's going to be like to bridge the gap to Edwin Diaz. Um, and if you're starters, if you're dealing with starting pitching injuries and you're not getting deep innings from Verlander or Scherzer, you need that bullpen to be really good in the middle stages to get you to, to Diaz and then he'll shut down the game for you. And I just don't have a ton of confidence in that group to, to bridge that gap at the moment. I will say that I think what they're going to do is put either Tyler McGill, Joey Lucchesi, Drew Peterson, or a combination of those three into the bullpen while the, the typical starting five are, are up and kind of keep them as a swing man and a multi-inning reliever. Um, so that, you know, they can also insert them into the starting rotation upon injury, but um, also have an effect, a more effective reliever than some of those names you mentioned. That's, that's my assumption. Anyway, I, I could be wrong. Yeah. I mean, even Miguel struggled last year too. I mean, I, I like yeah. him a lot, but I mean, he's most likely going to be in the rotation, obviously with the, the Quintana injury that happened today uh, with his stress fracture in his rib. So I don't know. It's, yeah. it's going to be interesting to see what they're able to do there, but. Um, you know, what is our outlook and grade for the off season? All right. So, you know how all we, like how many guys we talked about there, we talked about Verlander a little bit. We talked about Brandon Nimmo. Um, you know, what we didn't mention was Carlos Correa, uh, who had originally signed with the giants and then he signed with the Mets and then he left and did not sign with the Mets anymore. And, and now the Mets biggest outside addition to the team is Kodai Senga. After that, it's maybe David Robertson. Uh, this team is the same team or worse than last year. And I think it's probably worse overall uh, that won, what, 102 games or 101 games, end up losing the division. Um, you know, this is a good team, but it's not a team that got better. They did not go out and win this offseason other than maybe what Kodai Senga did. So I'm giving them a D just because... A lot of those signings are Jeff McNeil re-signing, Brandon Nimmo re-signing, right? They, you know, they just didn't get better. Right? Justin Verlander was just a replacement for Jacob deGrom. And the minute he goes down with another elbow injury, it's all over, right? And that was for $40 million or something like that. So, you know, while Steve Cohen's pockets are, are very deep and, you know, we keep kind of kind of ran into, oh, the Mets just keep paying for whoever. They paid for all the guys they already had. Um you know, and last offseason was definitely an A. They had a lot of outside pieces. This offseason, they had one, in, really, in uh, Kodai Senga. So I, I'm just not sure that, that this team is going to make any steps forward. Um, I think they're definitely, they definitely moved back closer to the Mets, especially if DeGrom is healthy in Texas and, and Verlander is not. You know, they're relying on some really scary stuff to, to be able to win those 100 games again. I don't know if it's going to happen. This division is a little more difficult now. And yeah, I, I'm I'm certainly the Mets are a contender for this division, but I'm less confident in them than I was last year. And, and you could even say that Senga basically replaced Chris Bassett. Yeah. Right, right, right. So, so. yeah, I mean, I, I'm on a similar page. I gave him a C mainly because like while 
you're right. They didn't get better. They did have to re-sign all those guys to stay to stay as good as they were last year. I mean, like Brandon Nimmo, they could have easily let him walk and go to Toronto or something, and then they're stuck without a good center field option. So, like, I think that that is something that's important. But, but like you said, I mean, when you look at their outlook, like they did, I really don't think they're better than they were last year. I think they're kind of the same, honestly. Like Nemo replaced well Nemo. And then you've got, you know, like like you mentioned, Verlander is just a replacement for DeGrom. And honestly, like, I know Verlander was fantastic last year, deserved the Cy Young. But on a talent standpoint, at this stage of their careers, I don't think he's as good as DeGrom to start with. And I think the injury concern is similar just because Verlander is 40 and has had Tommy John surgery recently. And DeGrom is, you know, a little bit younger, but he's had more recent, like, nagging injury type things. Um, you know, Senga, like you mentioned, is a replacement for Bassett. Like, I think that they're like, I mean, Kitana even was a replacement for Tywin Walker who left. I mean, it's like yeah. they literally didn't get better. They just stayed the same. And honestly, last year, this team really overperformed a lot of their expected metrics at, at times last year. Um, I think they, their sequencing was really good um, in, in a lot of ways. And I think they're good. I think the Mets are really good. I think that their lineup is pretty solid. I, the thing is about this team, I worry about their injury concerns. I mean, their rotation, their three top guys in their rotation, or they have four four guys in their rotation who should be good, and three of them are above 36 years old. One of them's 40, and one of them's 39, and then Carrasco's 36. So you've got Kode Singa, who's really an unknown. I mean, now we think he's going to be at least decent. Like, he's looked pretty good in spring training so far. Like, he's got good stuff. But, you know, he's kind of an unknown being a being a guy that's come over from overseas. And, I mean, they're, they're like you said, the bullpen's kind of a – I think their bullpen's going to be fine. But, like, I don't know. Like, their lineup's going to be solid. They're going to be a pesky team. They're going to be tough to get out. And it'll be interesting. The one thing I will say about this team, though, they do have some prospects that could make a move at the big league level. And I think there's a good chance that one of Brett Beatty – or uh, or uh, Francisco Alvarez ends up having a good year at the big league level this year. One of them will. I think Brett Beatty's kind of my pick for the one that would would have the year, but we'll see what happens there. Um, but I, I, I I'd see a scenario where one of their prospects comes up and really helps them a lot. Yeah, I gave them a C, and the reason was is because it could be a whole hell of a lot worse for the Mets. You could have not re-signed Brandon Nimmo. And could have went out there and got Kevin Kiermeyer. I mean, you could have sure you, you Jacob Degrom is is gone, but you could have not signed Justin Verlander. I mean, Chris Bassett left and Taiwan Walker left, but I think you couldn't have. I mean, signed Kodai Senga, who I think replaces Bassett and Quintana, who's not going to be much worse than Taiwan Walker was. Like this team could have been a lot worse. That's why I think. You know, a C is fair. It could have been a lot better. You could have signed Correa. Um, you know, you could have went big name hunting in other places. You could have just re-signed DeGrom and had that guy too. But overall, I, it's a team that should still compete in this division. It, it should still be a really good team. Um, you know, we were surprised they got bounced out of the playoffs last year, and we were saying that they're the same team pretty much. A lot more risk, but they're a team that we still expect to make a good run. Um you know, and and one thing without signing Correa, you mentioned Brett Beatty. Mark Viento should also get called up um, this year. He got a little bit of time last year. He has big power potential. Uh, Ronnie Mauricio is a guy who is up and coming as well. Only got to Double A. He's looked really great so far through spring. Showed off a lot of power, which is something that he had, you know, lacked before. Uh, if, if, so if that's real, Francisco Alvarez. You know, they got off the James McCann contract. You got Omar Narvaez and Thomas Nito, but Alvarez is not going to be blocked. I mean, that those guys aren't going to block him. There's still potential they can bring up some young, impactful players on this team to help even more. Um, so I definitely think that this team it will content, contend uh, for this division. Uh, it could have been a lot better, but it could have been a whole hell of a lot worse. That's why I give them a C. But moving on to the... Atlanta Braves, or I guess if we want to call them the Oakland Las Vegas Braves or whatever, since they have all the A's. But David, who do you uh, who do you like? Yeah, so I'm I'm going with the mustache. Uh, I'm going with Spencer Strider, and 
for very specifically Spencer Strider last year, had he pitched the entire season would have been like a, a record setting level of good um, in terms of starting pitching. Like he very much feels like it did back when Justin Verlander was starting to take over when it came to throwing in the hot in the hundreds out of a small stature, uh, putting up just absolutely crazy um, uh, strikeout numbers. And I didn't even realize this, but he went to Clemson. So uh, yeah, double <laughs> doubling down on this, but I, I just think Spencer Strider's, uh, you know, swing and miss potential is otherworldly. He had 200 strikeouts and 130 innings pitch last year. You know, if he could stay healthy and get through a whole season at that level, which I mean, his his baseball savant profile is like all deep in the red in terms of strikeout rates and spin rates and velocities. And he's just the type of pitcher that, you know, we, we find you know somebody's going to have to come come up when when Clayton Kershaw, Justin Verlander, Max Scherzer, they all are starting to get old and start to get ready to retire and. We're going to have to have guys who step up and become the next best pitcher in baseball. To me, it feels like Spencer Strider is one of those guys who's just going to keep keep taking the baseball world by storm. He'll come out with something else this season. He'll have a, a sweeping slider or a hammer curveball or or something to, to even further increase those whips because his game's going to be missing bats, and, and he's going to do it at an elite level, I think, again, and hopefully for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. love Spencer Strider, and uh... – you know, he's also signed to a long-term deal for pretty cheap, so yep. uh, that's nice. Uh, but I, I, everybody I, on the Braves? That's that's yeah, that's what I, that's what I'm saying. But um, so but so you mean he's a, just an Atlanta Braves player? He's a Braves but player, signed yeah. on a long deal for a long yeah, good deal yeah. for a long time. He, I am a tiny bit worried about injuries with him though going forward. Of course, because uh, there's 102. <laughs> yeah, especially, well, especially with him because he's smaller and he's already dealt with a lot of injuries in his career uh, in college. He had Tommy John, and then in the last year he had the lat strain that kind of cost him the end of the season. But but I love him when he's out there. He's been unbelievable. But uh, the guy I wanted to talk about was Matt Olson. Uh, Matt Olson last year had a lot of red on his baseball savant page as well, and. He had a very underwhelming 120 WRC plus. Uh, there were a lot of Braves fans who were not happy that he, you know, with his performance for whatever reason, mainly just because he wasn't Freddie Freeman. But I think that there's a chance this year he's. I don't think he's going to be Freddie Freeman, but I think he could be kind of back close to that. Like he's a guy who was one of the most shifted players in baseball, and that's reflected in his low batting average on balls in play that he's had throughout most of his career. And uh, I think that that's something that 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 will improve this year. He looked unbelievably good in spring training and he looks a lot less worried about like trying to, about changing his approach up. I think kind of related to that shift thing too. I think he's going to benefit from that. He had 34 homers last year, hit a ton of doubles, hit a lot of balls like off the wall and stuff. And I think that there's a good chance that, um, that could, you know, some of those could turn into home runs again. And I mean, he played 162 games, and I love that about some of these guys on the Braves. Like, they play every single day no matter what, and sometimes that can be a problem because, you know, wear and tear by the end of the season, but but I do like that they that they want to play every single day, which is awesome. So um, I'm a big fan of Matt Olson coming into the season. Big fan of Matt Olson. Well, going from one former Oakland A to another uh, former <laughs> Oakland A, um, my brave that I like is Sean Murphy. Uh, uh, we talked about it in the in the trade episode. I think Sean Murphy is very very underrated. I think him being on Oakland uh, with how bad that team was, with how bad hitting in the Coliseum is in general. Uh, let's just take a look at his 2022 home road splits. In 302 at bats at home, he hit 227 with seven homers. And 21 doubles, 32 singles. In 200 or 310 plate appearances on the road, hit 45 singles, 16 doubles, 11 homers for a 271 average. So he hit more homers, hit for a better average, slightly less doubles, but was just an overall more effective hitter on the road. Now being able to go to a place like Atlanta, which at times can play like a bandbox, and getting into a lineup that is not having what Chad Pinder protecting him or Tony Kemp protecting him. You're going into a lineup where you have Matt Olson 
where you have Ronald Acuna Jr., you have Ozzy Albies, you have Austin Riley. I mean, you you could just keep listing the names. You know, we talked about a five tool player in JT Romuto at catcher. I think Sean Murphy has that potential. And people would now actually be able to see that in Atlanta with a good lineup around him. This team just got infinitely better with with upgrading their catcher, and he's really, really good defensively. Like Sean Murphy in 2023 is going to be a stud. Completely agree. Yep. <laughs> my my player I'm worried about. I, I it's funny, I didn't even realize this. I chose both of the Braves' uh playoff heroes from 2021 yeah. as my yeah. uh, worried players got Solaire earlier. We got Eddie Rosario now. Uh, Eddie Rosario had a 61 WRC plus this last season. He was worth negative 1.1 wins above replacement. Uh, I listen. It's not that I don't believe in Eddie Rosario because I do think Eddie Rosario is very much a, maybe not a hyper platoon, but more of a platoon type bat and a guy who is situationally a better hitter than he is over the grind of a whole season. I also know he was dealing with some issues last year that may be back this season. Um, and then Eddie Rosario's plate approach is already very volatile with just a, a lot of swing and not, uh, not a lot of walk taking, but you know, this is a guy who was routinely a well above average hitter for Minnesota a few years back. And then he was a playoff hero for Atlanta. So, um, you know, I, I do think that there's some some ground to stand on, but I wonder if Eddie Rosario has kind of hit that uh, that downward slope on his career a little bit. And, you know, knowing what they have here in left field, he, one of these guys has to get get there to kind of round out this lineup completely. Overall, there's like no weaknesses on this team. They've got great pitching depth. They've got a good bullpen. They've got a great lineup. They have everything really well taken care of. But that left field position is worrisome. I picked one. We're going to see another one coming up with somebody else's pick. It's a it's a revolving door. I think Eddie Rosario is probably the best option to uh, to be able to fill in for this. But if he can't get back to what he was before he got to uh, you know 2022, I don't know that there's any way he will be able to get back to it. So um, you know that, that's what I'm worried about. Uh, Matt, who are you worried about? Yeah, just to add on Eddie Rosario a little bit, um, he last year he had an eye issue that like he had to get like major eye surgery, and the hope is that it will help. He'll be better this year coming off of that. But that's that's a, something that you hear a lot too. Yeah, like a guy has vision problems, comes back and he's still not very good. But we'll see. Maybe maybe he'll figure it out at least to be a okay player again. But uh, the guy I've worried about a little bit is Charlie Morton. Uh, Anytime you have a pitcher that's 39 years old, there's, you know, reason to be worried a little bit or or be at least cautious. But I'm a little bit more worried about Charlie Morton because last year wasn't as good as his past several years had been. He was still fine last year, like especially his ex-fip was a 360, which is still pretty solid. But he was getting hit really hard last year. He had a he was in the 17th percentile for hard hit rate. His average exit velocity was really high. And he also started walking guys last year. He had his highest walk rate since 2018 last year at a 3.30 walks per nine, which is not very good. His ground ball rate dropped by almost 10%. So he was le- he, his command wasn't quite there. His fastball velocity was still pretty good. It wasn't as much as it was in 2021, but it was still good. But he's he's 39 years old. He hit he had a lot of hit by pitches last year too, like back foot breaking balls. Um, I, I mean he's I think he's fine if you're looking for him to be a number four, which that's kind of what the Braves are looking for right now. But for a guy who he signed for 20 million dollars this year, which is a lot for a guy that I think is probably a number four at this stage. So hopefully he comes out and is able to, you know kind of be back to his 2021 form he did not have a normal offseason last year after the broken ankle that he suffered in the world series but uh we'll see what happens with him i'm just not super high on that signing and, and him coming into 2020 uh 2023 yeah the guy that i'm worried about is marcelo zuna um he's a guy who at times looks absolutely lost to the plate he still has a ton of power i mean he still hit 23 homers last year um, he was even incredibly unlucky, like his 226 batting average, his expected batting average was like 256, like 30 points lower. 
you know, that would make his on base go up and his, his WRC plus was 88. He had that. He's probably closer to a league average hitter. Um, <clears throat> but the problem with Marcelo Zuna is he is terrible, terrible, terrible defensively. And that seems to be the biggest thing that he's worried about coming into this year is that he wants to play more outfield and he doesn't want to DH as much anymore. And it's like, you're so bad defensively. You hurt your team out there. You just need to focus on the plate, do what you do well over there and just focus on getting back to the hitter. You were, you know, it will say pre 2020. Cause he had a great year that year. But if you can just get back to like 2018, like get back to a 107 WRC plus, you know, the 280, 260, 280 average hit your 20 to 30 homers. I think the Braves take that easily, but after struggling last year, still you're not really worried about what you what changes you can make to improve that, and you're really worried about trying to play the field more at the moment, rather than just doing what you do well and trying to be a DH. I, I, I'm extremely worried about what what that means and how this Braves clubhouse already seemed to kind of be annoyed at them last year. What's that going to do until 2023? I'm not. I'm not on the Marcelo Zuna train either. So. Yeah, but uh, so David, let's do your outlook and grade for 2023. Yeah, so that the grade for this offseason is absolutely an A. Um, this team spent almost no money, and they picked up maybe the third or fourth best position player available in Sean Murphy. Um, and this isn't a team that didn't need to spend any money, right? They've extended all their players. They've already been super smart with their money. We talk about it all the time that, you know, the Braves are just a team that absolutely has nailed down the, you know, the extension uh, of the young players and, and to lock in a, a core group as good as this it has been remarkable. Um, this team's going to, they're looking to try to rebuild that, uh, that 1990s and early 2000s magic when they won like 15 NL Easts in a row or something like that. Like, I, I think this, this is definitely a really good start. You know, they, they've picked up Lucas Lukey too, who I thought was a, a questionable let, uh, release by the Yankees. I think he'll be good for them in, as a lefty out of the bullpen. I just really like the way this Braves team is shaping up. I think they're probably my favorite team in this division. I'll, I'll put them as my division favorite um, just because they won it last year, got a, a lot better when it came to Murphy. And, you know, they lose Dansby Swanson, but I think everybody really likes the upside that Von Grissom brings. And he won't be as good as Dansby, but I think the upgrade from their catching situation to Sean Murphy is so much more important overall uh, to both the lineup and to the pitching staff that, you know, I, I love Dansby. He's on the Cubs now, but that that is such a much more big and a more impactful uh, player for this team, given the replacement. So uh, I think this Braves team is actually better, even though they've done very little. And I think that's the kind of offseason you want to have as a contender where you just improve slightly around the margins. You make your team, your team just a little bit better, and that's enough to get you back into the playoffs and back into the World Series. Yeah, I, I'm. I I agree. It's, I think the Braves are the division favorite here. Uh, the one guy, the one, the one thing I, I gave him a B for the post for the uh, off season. I love the Sean Murphy deal, and someone brought it up the other day, and I think that it's, I think it's kind of the most important thing with that deal. The Braves for the past, ever since Alex Anthopoulos has been in charge, they've been ignoring throwing from the catcher just because they valued framing and a little bit of offense more than the than throwing because nobody was stealing bases. Well, this year with the new rules, they said, oh, God, we've got Travis Darnode, who is a good catcher, good defensively, whatever. He doesn't throw people out. We've got to get somebody who can throw people out, too. So they went and got Sean Murphy. I think that was kind of a kind of a sneaky thing that was part of the signing that hadn't really gotten mentioned that much. Um, I think that I gave him a B instead of an A mainly because they didn't address left field at all or DH. Like I thought that they might bring in somebody like a Mitch Hanniger type guy, or a, maybe a, just somebody who has a little bit more, a little bit higher floor because the floor for Eddie Rosario and Marcelo Zuna and some of the, not the non-roster invites they brought in, like, like Sam Hillier, Jordan Luplo, Eli White. Like they brought in a bunch of guys, Kevin Pilar is another guy they brought in. Like there's a chance that like not a single one of them are even like a remotely okay big leaguer this year, so that they really I would have liked to have seen them address left field, and um, then pitching wise, I, 
I thought that they might, might want to add another fifth starter. Like Ian Anderson just last year was bad, and the Braves kind of believe in him, but man, his stuff's just not very good. He needed to go. I, I don't know if he went to drive line or something. He hadn't looked great in the spring so far, but there was a lot of talk about him coming out with a new pitch this spring. So maybe he's been working on that or something. But, but I don't know. But but you know when you kind of look at this team as a whole, like the just to, just to show how good this bullpen is, the Braves' number six bullpen arm, probably the sixth guy of the bullpen, is Kirby Yates. And there's been a lot of talk in the. Uh, among Braves people about who doesn't make the bullpen. And the guy that I think a lot of people are saying might get optioned is Dylan Lee. And he had a 213 ERA in 52 innings last year. Like, that's how good this bullpen is. Like, that guy might not make the bullpen. And then, like, lineup-wise, I mean, they're, you know, I would be shocked if Michael Harris isn't as good as he was last year. But... I mean, I'd be shocked if Ronald Acuna isn't better than he was last year, too. And they also have a full season of Ozzy Albies, hopefully, this year, you know, after he was hurt most of the year last year. So we'll see. That probably makes up for losing Dansby Swanson. And um, I think the biggest thing's going to come down to maybe rotation health. Like, Spencer Strider's going to be super important to stay healthy for this team because I think Kyle Wright's a really good number three guy in the rotation. Max Fried's really good. Charlie Morton's fine. It's like a number four. I think you'll be able to figure out number five, but Spencer Strider being that second like ace level pitcher is huge for this team if he stays healthy. But I am worried about him staying healthy all year just because like last year he dealt with injuries, in the past he's dealt with injuries. Like this feels like a guy you, we might in a few years talk. I hope it's not, but in a few years we might talk about as this super talented pitcher that came up and then just never stayed healthy. Like, I just hope that's not the case with him, but we'll see. I really like this team. I think they're definitely the division favorite for me. Yeah. So I gave him an A minus. Uh, they're the division favorite. Um, I, I think this team did a lot this off season, a lot of good things. You know, Acuna is not going to be as bad as he was last year. Olsen's going to have an uptick in his production this year. You're getting, you're replacing the catcher production with Sean Murphy, who's going to bring an uptick there. You're going to get a full season of a Michael Harris, you know, another 150 at bats from him or plate appearances. That's going to be a big help. Uh, getting a full season of Ozzy Albies, that's going to be gigantic. You know, I don't think Eddie Rosario is going to be as bad as he was last year. And it looks like he'll probably be in the platoon with Jordan Luplo, anyways. Like, I think that's just fine. The pitching staff. It looks fine if you get uh, Soroka back, which is a guy who's battled injuries the last few years. But when he was pitching, he was really, really good. He could be that solution to the fifth starter spot. Bryce Elder's also there. Uh, I think they have enough guys to figure it out from there. And even one guy that Matt didn't mention in the bullpen, um, you know, was that is Nick Anderson. I was just he's, about to mention him. <laughs> he's he's a guy who he can easily make this bullpen as well and he is a former like all-star closer um and this then you would be looking at like Inglacius Minter I think Joe Jimenez is in for a good year as well Colin McHugh who I know David really hates because he lost him the oh fantasy God. championship <laughs> last year we might I had to, to put that in there for that. Adam because uh, yeah so Adam and David uh, in our fantasy league last year oh came God. down were exactly tied and on the last day of the season, we weren't tied. We weren't tied. I, know, I was up. We I was up you six up. five one. We were That's tied right. in holds. That's right. And tied in holds. Colin McHugh in the last day of the season gets a hold, ties it up, and, and Adam I, wins off the tiebreaker because he the, was first seed. And the tiebreaker was only because of we played one game, and last day I lost one category to him. Oh, so and that's what the makes... only reason he had the tiebreaker over me. Anyway, it was it, it's it's uh, it's an aside, but it, it was the closest possible was, fantasy was baseball the, result of all time. Was that the game that didn't matter? Like the last the day after clinching? Yeah, yeah, it was the day <laughs> after clinching. And Dansby Swanson, I have Dansby and Matt Olson, and Adam had Francisco Lindor, and we were like tied in batting average. Yeah. And Dansby yeah. homered, and Matt Olson had a base hit, and Lindor went over four, and I was like, oh, it's over. And I had no idea Colin McHugh was pitching, and it was just horrible. Thought <laughs> yeah, I had game, it. Yeah, Jackson anyway, Stevens started it was, that it was game quite the, the It was quite the he, showdown. Yeah, he had the biggest hangover I think I've ever seen a pitcher have. Like, he was literally, like, bloodshot eyes that, like, almost looked like he was about to throw up on the mound after throwing two pitches. Like, he was – like, it was hilarious. But anyways, back to the point. <laughs> yep. Colin McHugh is in here. 
He's good. Uh, yeah, and then, it's, it's, yeah. It sucks. And then you got Lukey, Kirby Yates, I mean, Dylan Lee, and then you have the option to have Nick Anderson. Like that can be just an absolutely disgusting bullpen. This team should be the division favorite. They should probably be right there in the NL favorites. Um, with a couple of teams we'll talk about here in a couple of weeks, but it's a really good team. There's not much around it and they got a lot better and they're going to hopefully have a lot of their players healthy again this year and better than they were last year. So it's a, it's a scary thought for baseball and it's a really good thought if you're uh, if you're Matt here. I love it. But uh, I'm sure you do. You were pretty quick to respond to say if we were recording today uh, or not. So well, I think you're to pretty be fair, excited. To be fair, I asked what division are we doing because I thought we were doing the West. So Yeah, right after that. But. Semantics. Anyways, um, so to wrap up the episode, we got the WBC starting, I believe, tomorrow night. Um, we will have to get an episode in at some point about the World Baseball Classic. It kind of snuck up on us here. But anything you guys are looking forward to kind of previewing that a little bit just just quickly before we wrap it up? Yeah, I can start. I love the World Baseball Classic. I think all three of us do. And I wanted to mention that I think the most fun thing about it is not the games where the U.S. is playing the DR or something, but it's the games like we'll see tomorrow night where Cuba plays the the Netherlands uh, or, you know, in a Wednesday, you've got Panama playing the uh, playing Taiwan and Australia playing Korea. It's really fun to see these places where we don't see a lot of players from there. You know, even though some of them are American players who are going and playing for, you know, places their ancestors came from or something, too, at times. But it's really fun to see, uh, you know, see guys that we've never really heard of that, you know, are playing like especially with the Korean and Japanese teams. Uh, that, you know, play in their home countries that we've never seen before that are really, really good baseball players. They might not be like high-level big leaguers, but it's a lot of fun to see them and the culture behind baseball in their countries. And I think that's just a blast to watch. So I cannot wait. I think tomorrow is going to be really fun. I think that going forward, like the World Baseball Classic is just going to blow up. You see it with how many big leaguers are playing in it this year and, and star players too. I know we've had a few dropouts recently due to injuries and, and whatever, but uh, I'm really, really excited for the World Baseball Classic. Yeah, I'm excited for some of these prospects that get an opportunity to play with like big league, you know, big name MVP players. Like uh, I just know, for example, like Owen Casey's playing with Freddie Freeman. And I think that's just a huge opportunity for a guy like that. Um, I think they're Team Canada. So uh, I do think that in terms of the best teams, if you're looking to watch uh, one specific group, you're probably looking at watching Team Japan team usa or team uh, dominican republic i think those are the three teams that are really strong uh team japan's gonna have roki sasaki and it'll be a kind of a rare opportunity for us to get to get to watch that kid he's probably the next you know you darvish shohei otani type of japan imported pitcher who is going to be just really good um but he won't be over for a few years, but I think he's only like 21 or 22. Yeah. So he may be throwing 101, 102 in there. Uh, and just, it, we'll see him shut down some, some really good major league pitchers, I think. So I, I'd say he's probably the number one player to look out for. And then those were the three teams that I think are going to be really good and really tough to beat. So yeah. That, yeah that's that Japan right. team also has Shohei Otani as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. The, and as, as, Darvish. Just, yeah. And uh, I don't know if you saw it today, but, uh, Otani hit like a 400 and like 30 something foot homer on one knee already during a Japan warm up game. So yeah. that was fun. Uh, and I believe Roki will be over, I think next year, actually. I think he's to be posted after he's the boy. season. He's if close, I'm not yeah. mistaken. He's going to be huge um, whenever he comes over. It, but, um, you know, like unlike Matt, what Matt said, uh, I very much look forward to the Dominican Republic versus United States games because the energy in those games is unmatched. Mm -hmm. Like, the, the the other games they're great i mean it's fun to watch these matchups of young players and that this and that but when you get two teams that are absolutely stacked and you get that moment with that energy with all those players playing for their country there man like i mean that san diego the game in san diego where mm -hmm. adam jones robs his teammate manny machado of a homer like in the finals like that that moment is unmatched and i just i hope we get another moment that is as cool as that this year me too Hey, one more one more note on the World Baseball Classic. If you ever watched Vladimir Ballantine play baseball, you're in your dream. <laughs> Dude, last last World Baseball Classic absolutely hits tanks. Yeah, in Netherlands, right? 
Yeah. That's tomorrow night. You got to watch yep. it. Yep. There's a, there's a lot of good baseball going to be here uh, in the next couple weeks that we will absolutely have to cover at some time somehow. But uh, make sure you guys tune in for that. And thank you guys for tuning into this episode of the Bat Flip Podcast. And we'll catch you guys next week.